five things that happened after Jesus died. Number one, there was an earthquake. There was a response of creation after Jesus died. We read, the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Nature itself was shaken by the death of the Son of God. Matthew says first that the earth shook and the rocks split. This language implies that this is a significant earthly reaction to the divine events on the cross. Number two, the tombs open. Matthew then records an incident found in none of the other Gospels. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised to life and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection. They entered the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Matthew chapter 27 verses 52 through 53. While earthquakes can damage tombs, since they were carved out of stone, the raising of bodies can only be attributed to God's direct action, which implies that he is behind the earthquake. Because of the geological characteristics of Palestine, which sits on a major seismic rift, an earthquake would not be an unusual event. But coupled with rocks splitting to open tombs, this is another significant testimony to the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion. Another earthquake will soon testify to a further significant divine event, Jesus' resurrection. Matthew's unique record of these events emphasizes the victory over death that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross accomplishes. Those who were raised are described literally as those who had fallen asleep, a common New Testament idiom for a person who has died, but whose eternal destiny is secure. As with the initial testimony, the supernatural raising of the bodies of these holy ones and their appearances in Jerusalem is striking testimony to Jesus' accomplished work on the cross and thereafter his resurrection. The expression holy people probably refers to pious Old Testament figures, heroes and martyrs from Israel's history selected to bear miraculous testimony to these events. Their appearance to people in Jerusalem is a witness to the efficaciousness of Jesus' work on the cross and the declaration of his victory over death in his and their resurrection. This anticipates Paul's teaching on Jesus being the first fruits of the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. But now, as things really are, Christ has in fact been raised from the dead and he became the first fruits, that is, the first to be resurrected with an incorruptible, immortal body, foreshadowing the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since it was by a man that death came into the world, it is also by a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's own will be resurrected with incorruptible immortal bodies at his coming. The raising of these holy ones is a foretaste of the resurrection to which all believers can look forward. Through the death of Jesus, a new day has arrived, a day when death has been defeated by death, and resurrection to life eternal has been made possible. But notice that it was not until after the resurrection of Jesus that the occupants of these tombs were raised and went into Jerusalem, where they appeared to many. The Bible does not say whether these risen saints died again or went to heaven with the Lord Jesus. The death of the Son of God shook nature itself. Popular preacher Charles Spurgeon stated, Men's hearts did not respond to the agonizing cries of the dying Redeemer, 
but the rocks responded. The rocks were rent. He did not die for rocks. Yet rocks were more tender than the hearts of men, for whom he shed his blood. It is best to understand that Matthew intended for us to see that the earthquake occurred on the day that Jesus was crucified. Then, on the day he was revealed as resurrected, the power of new life was so strong that it brought back some of the good people who had died. This is one of the strangest passages in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew does not provide us with a great deal of information, and we do not learn about this occurrence from any other source. Number 3. The Temple Veil Was Cut in Two Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 through 51 And Jesus cried out again with a loud agonized voice, and gave up his spirit, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his Father's plan. And at once, the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were split apart. The curtain that covered the temple was ripped in two places. The curtain was the only thing in the temple that differentiated the holy area from the holiest part of the temple. It was a very clear illustration of the separation between God and man. Acts chapter 6 verse 7 says that in the days of the early church, a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Perhaps this torn veil demonstrated to them the greatness of the work of Jesus. It is also probably how the torn veil became common knowledge. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 tells us that in the temple, a veil separated the Holy of Holies, the earthly dwelling place of God's presence, from the rest of the temple where men dwelled. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 3 Now even the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and for the earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle, sacred tent was put up, the outer one or first section, in which were the lampstand and the table with its loaves of the sacred showbread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was another tabernacle, the inner one or second section known as the Holy of Holies. The book of Exodus teaches that this thick veil was fashioned from blue, purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Now Christ is our superior high priest, and as believers in his finished work, we partake of his better priesthood. We can now enter the Holy of Holies through him. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 20 says, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. When we look at this scene, we perceive a picture of Jesus' flesh being torn for us, just as he was tearing the veil for us. The book of Hebrews provides a gloriously detailed explanation of the profound meaning that is associated with the tearing of the veil. The veil that was always hanging in the temple served as a constant reminder that sin makes human beings unworthy to be in God's presence. The fact that the sin offering was presented once a year, in addition to the myriad of other sacrifices that were presented on a daily basis, was a glaring illustration of the reality that sin could not be really atoned for or eradicated by mere animal sacrifices. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the boundaries that used to separate God and people have been destroyed, and we can now approach God with confidence and boldness. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Inasmuch then as we believers have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith 
and cling tenaciously to our absolute trust in him as Savior. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. Therefore, let us with privilege approach the throne of grace, that is, the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find His amazing grace to help in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. Jesus' body was torn, and so was the veil, each indicating that now we can come to God boldly. We have a high priest who presides over the heavenly courts to make certain the believer has total access. At the moment Christ died, the heavy woven curtain separating the two main rooms of the temple was torn by an unseen hand from top to bottom. The death of God's Son was also accompanied by huge tremors in the natural world, as if there was some sort of emotional connection between inanimate creation and the one who made it. Number 4. There was darkness all over the land. Matthew chapter 27 verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. 3 p.m. There was thick darkness over the whole land. Now the scripture was fulfilled. Amos chapter 8 verse 9. It shall come about in that day, says the Lord God, that I shall cause the sun to go down at noon, and I shall darken the earth in broad daylight. The people have often demanded of Christ a sign from heaven, and now they had one but such a one as signified the blinding of their eyes. At this point in the afternoon, it would be twelve o'clock, and the darkness would continue until the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock. This otherworldly darkness appeared when the sun was shining the brightest. Because the moon was now full, it couldn't have been created by an eclipse because it can't intervene between the earth and the sun when it's full. God's quick intervention undoubtedly brought about this darkness. Astronomy knowledge was rudimentary at the time. Phlegon also mentions an earthquake, which aligns his story closely with the sacred record. The creature could not bear the wrong done to its creator. Therefore the sun withdrew his rays, that he might not behold the deeds of the wicked. The darkness occurring at such a critical moment can signify several things. First, darkness was associated in antiquity with mourning. Darkness was also associated with the death of great men. Both Gentile and Jewish readers could understand darkness as a cosmic sign that accompanied the death of a king. In addition, darkness was a sign of God's judgment. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised to life, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city Jerusalem and appeared to many people. Matthew chapter 27 verses 52 through 53. Number 5. The soldier that oversaw the execution realized that he was innocent. Now the centurion and those who were with them keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe, and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27 verses 53 through 54. It was the centurion's job to ensure that the crucifixion was carried out correctly and without any complications. He was usually in charge of a hundred soldiers at the time of the crucifixion. 
He was a career soldier whose courage and intelligence had helped him rise through the ranks. He would be a soldier of the highest order. He would need to be both cold and efficient to succeed in this position. This man had to follow the orders of his superiors. The scene at the crucifixion of Jesus was so remarkable that even a hardened Roman centurion acknowledged that this was the Son of God. This realization meant Jesus was innocent of the crime. Jesus was on the cross for that very reason. The centurion must have had a mix of emotions. He just realized he had supervised the crucifixion of an innocent man. This was not the whispered words of a frightened recruit or the quavering words of a conscript who was easy to manipulate. Those were the reasoned conclusions reached by a seasoned veteran, a man who watched countless men suffer horrible ends and was responsible for putting them to death. This centurion was well aware of the strong condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders that had put Jesus on the cross for blasphemy. His commander-in-chief, Pontius Pilate, had sustained the conviction for Jesus making that claim. But the centurion forsakes the condemnation and declares Jesus' claim. Why? Because the arguments in favor of Christ were overwhelming. Although he had no doubt supervised many crucifixions, this execution was different. What did he see? Several scenes from the events of the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus combine into a compelling statement. The first was, the response of Jesus to the injustice that he had been forced to endure at the hands of his own countrymen through arrest and trials. This man had no doubt supervised many crucifixions. Could it have been Jesus' response to the torture he had suffered at the hands of the centurion and his men? One could think of the dignity with which Jesus responded to the lynch mob that demanded his blood, as a sheep, silent before the slaughter. Scripture records no response by Jesus to the mob's cries. Mark chapter 15, verses 11 through 15. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get him to release Barabbas for them instead. Again Pilate answered, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They screamed back, Crucify him. But Pilate asked them, Why? What has he done that is evil? But they screamed all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, set Barabbas free for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to his soldiers to be crucified. Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness, not his escape. The mercy of Jesus toward the people who rejected him and the soldiers that crucified him, including this centurion. His response? Father, forgive them. Luke chapter 23, verses 34 through 39. And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his clothes among themselves. Now the people stood by watching, but even the rulers ridiculed and sneered at him, saying, He saved others from death, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed of God, his Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and cruelly offering him sour wine, and sarcastically saying, If you are really the King of the Jews, save yourself from death. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who had been hanged on a cross beside him kept hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us from death. While they gambled for Jesus' possessions, 
Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness. It was not for his escape. What a powerful statement. Matthew chapter 27, verses 35 through 36. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him to guard against any rescue attempt. If all those did not convince him, he saw something else. He saw creation's response. Clearly, the centurion was shocked to be witness to such a dramatic event during the last hours of Christ, especially since he had never previously seen such a thing. This made the impact on him almost immeasurable. The centurion had seen, heard, and felt all of the events of the crucifixion and death of Christ. As a result, he and his troops became very frightened. Even though the centurion and his group of soldiers had learned to cope with fear, they were now experiencing sheer terror. It is that powerful cross and the love displayed there that moves hearts, even the hardened, battle-weary heart of a career soldier, from death to life. An old saying is, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. It was in the first century, and it still is today. The foot of the cross is where everyone, poor and rich, finds level ground to kneel and embrace the Christ who died for them. Truly, this is the Son of God. We have heard and we have believed. The journey must not end there. We must have a passion for knowing Him deeper. May that same desire burn in our hearts so we might honestly know the one who loved us and gave himself for us. One can't help but wonder about how coming in contact with Jesus affected the soldiers' lives. Did they become Christians? The pulpit commentary relates the tradition that the centurion's name was Longinus and that he became a devoted follower of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died as a martyr. This is just tradition. We do not know if this happened. But we do know that the truth has a way of holding on to a person's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion began as a Roman officer overseeing a crucifixion, but ended the day acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God. God has already taken the initiative in salvation. Christ died for you. Now, it's your move. Jesus gave up his life so we could have ours back. He died like us so we could live like him. He not only pleased his Father, but received us as a bounty. As a substitute for sinful humanity, Jesus suffered the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship. Horrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. There are others who consider this to be a myth, or at best, a theological story. These are all unique events that uniformly testify to God's unique acts in human history. These are extraordinary, supernatural testimonies that confirm